as I said, this, this is, uh, I almost need to give you a little caveat or warning. The first, we're going to look at history, and we don't have time to really look at all the amazing things that have happened through the church age of the last 250 years. And what I want to do is focus on some of the lessons that I think God has taught me that we as a congregation and as the worldwide church need to understand. And I, we, I might end up ruffling some feathers. I might end up giving you some information that you might be bothered by. My intention is not to um, put down anything. My intention is not to criticize anything. But we've got to, as, as mature believers, be able to handle information and be able to properly evaluate things without getting all offended every time somebody says something, right? We've got to learn how to process the lessons of history. So hopefully I can do that this morning. Thank you so much, Beth. Over the last eight months, uh, really over the last couple of years, but especially these last eight months, I've done a lot of seeking of the Lord for strategy for the church, really for the next 10 to 20 years. It's, it's really time that we set a, a compass point for the next period of time as we transition more into the apostolic, as we transition more into becoming the church that God really wants for these, this last generation. And, and as part of that strategy, the Lord, I really feel the Lord led me to start looking at some history. Um, interesting that we had a history course this summer as, as part of our midweek group. Um, and I took some of that information, most of it I just did from other personal study. And, and what I, just lessons that we need in order to navigate into the future, okay? Look at it that way. Lessons we need in order to navigate into the future in our personal lives, in, in, in this church's life, but also in the worldwide church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so I'm going to summarize for you today those lessons by looking at the major movements. I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. But we're going to look at the major movements because I think those are the things that really became the, the pivotal points in the church's history this last 250 years. So and that's what I'm going to do. Next week, I'm going to look at 1990. Next, did I say next week? Last week? Whatever. Next week, I'm going to look at 1990 to really 2013. But this week, we're looking at the mid-1700s to 1990. And... Um, the background is that by the mid-1700s, a lot of complacency had come into the church. There was a lot of spiritual dryness in Christians' lives in the middle of the 1700s. And, and people still were going to church, major attendance at a church in the in mid-1700s, uh, but there was very little passion. And it's almost as if the church were going through the motions. They, they, the, the people, the Christians, were not really passionate about their faith. And uh, they were kind of going to church religiously, okay? And hopefully that's not us today, but that's what was happening. And so in the middle of that, a group of preachers arose in the middle of 1700s, and they started to preach with a new conviction, a new passion, and a new power. And, and names like Jonathan Edwards, uh, uh, John Wesley, uh, George Whitfield, lots of other names of that period of time um, w w that we now call the Great Awakening, and um, that was good. And really, millions of people came to saving knowledge in the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle 1700s. But looking back on that period of time, I believe that there was a major problem in the way they were sharing. And the problem was that in order to turn people from complacency and apathy to passion for the Lord Jesus, they thought, how are we going to get people fired up? How are we going to get people really passionate about salvation? And they said, oh, we know what we do, what we'll do. We'll, we'll preach about hell all the time. Right? We're just going to talk about hell all the time. Because if we can get people to be scared to death of hell, they'll come to the, you know, into salvation, into the kingdom in record numbers. Um, you say, well, what's wrong with that? Hell is a real thing, right? It really is uh, bad news. Hell is real. Um, hell is a terrible place. Um, what's wrong with preaching about hell? Well, the problem was, if you preach about hell without understanding the love of God, you can really bring a distortion to people's lives. Let me, I'm going to share with you three passages out of a transcript of one of the messages preached in the mid-1750s, okay? Uh, I, and I apologize to our translators, our French translators. It's going to be very difficult. You might, like, don't try to 
translate my words, just try to get some concepts here. This is what it says. It's kind of in Old English. It says, this is one of the preachers, one of the most famous preachers of the middle 1700s. This is what he said in his actual transcript. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, he abhors you. And he is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of pure ire pure eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous servant, serpent is in ours. He continues, once the day of mercy is past, your most lamentable and dolorous cries and shrieks will be in vain. You will be wholly lost and thrown away from God. As to any regard to your welfare, God will have no other use to put you to but to suffer misery. You shall be continued to be uh, to no other end, for you will be a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction, and there will be no other use of this vessel but to be filled full of wrath. God will so be so far from pitying you when you cry to him that it is said that he will only laugh and mock at you. If you cry to God to pity you, he will be so far from pitying you in your doleful case or showing you the least regard of favor that instead of that, he will only tread you under his feet. And though he will know that you cannot bear the weight of omnipotence treading upon you, he will, uh, yet he will not regard that, but he will crush you under his feet without mercy. He will crush out your blood and make it fly." And you shall be sprinkled on his garments so as to stain all of his raiment. He will not only hate you, but he will have you in the utmost contempt. No place shall be thought fit for you, but under his feet to be trodden down as the mire of the streets. Did that get a lot of people into the kingdom in a hurry? Yeah. But here's the problem. That's not the God we serve. That's not the God we serve. See, those preachers were well-meaning. They saw the condition of the world, and they wanted people to come to saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to see people return to the Lord, but they ended up describing God in such a way that was so far from, the God, as, from God as he really is. So far from the way the Bible describes God. Yes, hell is a real place, but let, let's look at the motivation in God's heart. John, Joel, Joel chapter 2, verse 13. Don't tear your clothing in your grief, God says, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate. He's slow to get angry, and he's filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. It's not like God, like if, if you for some foolish reason, end up in hell. God's not going to be gloating. God's not going to be celebrating. God's not going to be mocking you. He's going to be, he's going to be grieving for you because of his love for you, his love for me. What are the consequences of... The, see, and what happened, it wasn't just one preacher. Most of the preachers of that period of time started preaching over and over hell. You know, we hear about the, you know, the sermons of hell and brimstone. That was not just a nice thing. They, like, that wasn't just a phrase that got put on them. They actually preached anger every Sunday. They preached loath every Sunday. They preached, uh, uh, just, they just spewed out their anger at people every, every weekend in their services. And that just so much distorted people's understanding of God. And here's the consequences of that fear, that fear-based Christianity of the mid-1700s. Number one, uh, for lack of a better word, I said fear-based Christianity. People didn't come to God because he loved them. They came to God to avoid punishment from him. They obeyed God not because they loved him and wanted to please him, but they obeyed God because they were scared to death of him. Look what 1 John chapter 4.18 says. If we're afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And that's what they were. They were afraid of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. See, there was no expression of his perfect love. And so people, all people had was fear of God. Well, the problem with that is, if you're afraid of God, you're not, not going to want to get close to him. 
You're, you're going to be, it's not like if you sin next weekend, you're not going to come into church on Sunday and say, God, I blew it again, but I just come into your presence, come boldly before your throne of grace. Would you please cleanse me again for my sin? No, that's not, like if you're afraid of God, you're going to come in, you're going to throw yourself on the altar, altar and say, God, please do not kill me. And that's what it was like in the mid-1700s. People were running to church on Sunday, begging God not to kill them, begging God not to doom them to hell. Fear-based Christianity of the mid-1700s. Number two, it was rule-based. Because, see, the Christians of that time became rule-based because they felt if they could obey enough rules, God wouldn't be quite so angry at them. And so they, everything became rule-based. Kids, don't do that because you, God may hurt you. God may punish you. So everything became about rules. There was no, there was no love and grace and, and mercy in those days. It was all about obey or God is going to get you. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2, 21 to 23. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they're based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So kids didn't, didn't remain pure because they wanted to be pure before God. They remained pure because they were scared to death of God. And as soon as they stopped being scared to death of God, they started to do whatever they wanted. Right? Because it was fear-based Christianity. It was rule-based Christianity. Number three, it was relationless Christianity. People didn't come to God, didn't give their lives to Jesus Christ to get to know him or out of response to his love. They came to God to escape his wrath. They saw him as an angry God, a God who wanted to send them all to hell. And, and like I said, hell is real. But people don't go to hell because God hates them. People go to hell because in spite of God's immense love, they choose to align themselves with the kingdom of this earth rather than embrace the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And at the end of time, it's the kingdom of this earth that will be thrown into hell. And the only way you're going to make it to hell if you choose to align yourself with that kingdom rather than God's kingdom. It's like in the Second World War, at the end of the Second World War in Japan, when the emperor of Japan said, I surrender because of his authority, everyone in Japan also were defeated and surrendered at the same time because they were part of that kingdom of that emperor in Japan, right? And so if at the end of time you have not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and entered into his kingdom, when God said it is time now to throw, and it even says in the Bible that hell was only created for the devil and his fallen angels. That's all hell was created for, for the devil and his fallen angels. And he said, but I'm also going to have to throw his kingdom into hell also. And if you make it there, it's because you've aligned with that kingdom. Okay, that's the only reason people go to hell. Not because of God's hate. God loves us so much. He is so passionate. He gave his son, folks, because he wants us to avoid the punishment of Satan and his, and his angels and those that choose to align themselves foolishly with that kingdom. <clears throat> John three sixteen. For God so loved the world... Not because he hated them. He so loved the world that so much that he gave his, own, his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It was motivated by love. God is always motivated by love. And so salvation is offered to us not so that we can escape hell, so, but so that we can experience the love of our Heavenly Father. You know, it's, it's so important to have or I'm sure, how do I say this? It is impossible to have a healthy relationship with someone you fear. Do we understand that? It's impossible to have a healthy relationship with someone you fear. And so if your relationship with God is based upon fear, there's no way you could ever draw close to him. Uh, f number four, and unfortunately it's not in your notes. I just got this late last night. But it's also legalism-based Christianity. You can add that to your notes if you want. It's legalism-based Christianity, the 1750s. Um, see, truth, again, I wish this was in your notes. Truth plus intimacy equals love, okay? Truth plus intimacy equals true love, true, true uh, liberty, true freedom. Truth minus intimacy always becomes legalism. 
If you're trying to parent your children and you're trying to teach them truth, but you don't express love at the same time, you will become legalistic. Period. You've got to ex- express the Father's love if you're going to discipline your children. Discipline meaning raise them up in the ways of the Lord, not punish, right? It means raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Anytime you try to preach truth, whether it's here in the pulpit on Sunday or whether it's to someone at work or one of your children or where, wherever in the workplace, if you do not share that truth in love, you will be, come across legalistic and you'll, become, you'll get a spirit of legalism. Okay? And so even though the, <clears throat> the, as the preachers were preaching about hell in the 1750s, they, choked the, they spoke the truth about hell. They really did. They, it's a terrible place. But they did so without an understanding, without expressing the love of God. And ever since, the foundation, unfortunately, the foundation of the evangelical church has been one of legalism. It really has been since the 1750s. The foundation of so much of the evangelical church has been one of legalism. Where we expect people to obey God and we expect people to obey our leaders, not in response to the incredible love of God and not in response to the love of the leaders, but because you have to. Because if you don't, we will find a way to punish you. Right? That's what we, we, we experience. And, and so any time a person tries to obey God without an intimate relationship with God, they will eventually become legalistic in their Christian life. And any time we try to get a person to obey God without expressing the love of God, we will become legalistic in our lives. Okay? Because legalism without intimacy always becomes... I'm sorry. Um, truth without intimacy always becomes legalism which is why, well, we're going to talk next week about the parenting course we're coming up with, which is based upon how to parent our kids, always expressing the love of the Father in everything we do. And it's going to be a life-changing course for some of you. Okay, so that was the 1750s. Then we come up to the 1800s. Right around the turn of the century as we got to 1800, a man named Thomas Paine, some of you might have heard that name, he wrote a book, a flyer actually, called The Age of Reason, and his subtitle was an investigation of true versus fabulous theology. Meaning one is truth, the other is fable. Fabulous meaning fabulish, okay? And he wrote this flyer, and he he wrote three parts of this flyer around the turn of the century. And in it, he challenged people, or he challenged the validity of the Bible because he claimed much of it was not reasonable, right? Uh, Instead, he argued that we should only believe those parts of the Bible that are rational, that are reasonable, that make sense, okay? Well, well, of course, therefore, miracles are not rational or reasonable, right? Rising from the dead is not rational or reasonable, right? Virgin birth is not rational or reasonable. So he questioned, pardon me? Walking on water and really forgiving those that had hurt you is not really reasonable or rational either. And so he threw out a lot of stuff that was in the Bible. And so almost in response to that new move around the turn of the century in the 1800s, there was a new group of pre- preachers arose. Uh, one of them, you know, Charles Finney. Most of you heard that name. Charles Spurgeon. Other people around that period of time, the, first, the turn of the century. And, and this new breed of preachers, this new style of preachers, they used logic and eloquence and, and, and strong arguments to win people to, to Christ. And, and certainly, like Charles Finney himself said, salvation is not a miraculous event at all. He said, if you give me anyone, if I have long enough, I will convince him the reasonableness of giving their lives to Christ. That's what Charles Finney said. Now, he, he won over a million people to the Lord. But it was all based upon ration reason. As you know, or maybe as you don't know, Charles Finney was a lawyer in his background before he became an evangelist. And, and again, people went to the Lord, but again, at what cost? Number one, there was a, the one consequence of this new type of rationale preaching was it resulted in an intellectual Christianity. Um, where people would only believe the gospel if, they, if it made sense to them, if it was reasonable and rational to them. Um, they believed if you could argue with a person long enough, 
eventually every person would have to agree with you and give your life to Christ. And so people who came to Christ in that period of time came because of very well-sounding arguments. But if you can come to Christ on reasonableness and rationalness and arguments, then you can actually turn your back on Christ if someone gives a better reason or argument or rationality, see? And so all these people were flip-flopping between, yeah, I kind of believe, oh, that makes more sense. Oh, well, yeah, that's a good, oh, no, but, and, and the Christianity in the early 1800s, people were double-minded because they, their, their faith was based upon only reason and rationality, okay? Well, I'm using a lot of big words even for me today. Um, but I'm, tr- I'm trying to, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that, that, that the, pardon me? Yeah, there is a place for apologetics, but, but if, if, if you, as I said, if you can win somebody into the kingdom through an argument, then someone else can equally win them out of the kingdom by another counter-argument, okay? And again, the reason I'm sharing these things with you is the legalism of the 1750s is still in the church today. And this rationality of the early 1800s is still in the church today. First Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. When I came to you, brothers, this is Paul's talking. This is, here's Paul's method. I did not come to you with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. He just said, this is what it's about. He didn't have to explain all these rational arguments. He, just, he said, I, I don't use argumentation. I don't use reason. I simply declare the truth with the anointing of God and with great conviction. I allow the Holy Spirit to convict people, and the Holy Spirit does the work. Okay? Other problem, or the other consequence of that rational Christianity, that reason-based Christianity, is it produced a powerless Christianity. Because of this emphasis on rationality and reason and logic, people began, even Christians began to question the truth of the miracles of the Bible and the supernatural involvement of God in our lives. And so they tried to live their lives according to the rules of God's word without expecting any divine help in living them out. They did not expect God to speak to them. They did not expect God to heal them or to help them in any supernatural way. And again, what did Paul say? My, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Right? Jesus himself, he, he, he preached the kingdom, it says, with signs and wonders following, con- confirming his word. He said, I preach with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith may not rest on on men's wisdom, but on God's power. So Paul did speak, and he did speak well at times, but he expected the power of God to bring proof to what he had just said, not his own ability to reason and argue. So that was the early 1800s. Then the mid-1800s, by the mid-1800s, because of all this emphasis on reason, much of the church had wandered from their belief in the core supernatural elements of the Bible, right? They called the liberalism of the church in the late 1800s. They, they started to question the virgin birth, the physical resurrection of Jesus, uh, other key doctrines. And so a new style of preachers arose who tried to turn the church back to God by saying, you know what, let's just come up with some core theologies, and if you can just believe these core theologies, then you're, it's okay, you're a Christian, Right? Sounded smart, sounded reasonable, and there were people, uh, they, so they came up with a list of doctrines. Yeah, we, we call them today fundamentalists, right? If you believe the fundamentals, you can make it into heaven. And Charles Hodge, um, John Gresham Macon, D.L. Moody, Billy Sunday, others around that period in the, in the uh, middle 1800s. And they were great preachers, and they led many to Christ, but, and they rightly emphasized that there are things that we have to embrace to be a Christian. They really emphasize that, right? The, the, the resurrection of Jesus, right? If there's no resurrection, then we are still in our sin, the Bible says. The physical return of Jesus, the atonement of Christ on the cross, the, the inerrancy of the scriptures, the virgin birth of Jesus. But unfortunately, because their teaching was based solely on intellectual agreement with theology, without any personal experience, they ended up teaching that the supernatural was only for the early church. And, and in order to then say, well, we've got to come up with a new theology to prove the supernatural was only for the early church, so they came up with a brand new doctrine called dispensationalism, 
or dispensationism that taught that God related to man differently through different ages, and in this last age, he only related through his word. He no longer related through the Holy Spirit. He no longer related man through signs and wonders, miracles. He only, he only related through his word. And so that's all that was left with just his word. And um, when they came up with this new theology, they said, okay, if you, want to, if you want to be accepted as a Christian, you have to believe this new theology. If you don't, you're not a Christian. And so they also developed a theology about the Lord's return, okay, called premillennialism, pre-tribulation, whatever. That was a theology that didn't start until the late 1800s. And, and, and then they said, okay, you have to agree with that new theology too. And if you don't, you're not really a Christian. You're not a biblical Christian. And, and unfortunately, by the late 1800s, it wasn't on, do you love Jesus? It wasn't, are you willing to give your life to him? It wasn't on, are you passionate about serving Christ the rest of your life? It says, do you believe in dispensationalism? Do you believe that, you know, Jesus is coming back this day at this, at this, with this expression? And if you didn't, they said, well, you're not really part of the church then. And they immediately wrote off over a third of every Christian, of every, a third of all the believers in the United States because they wouldn't embrace their theology. And, and so the whole movement in the late 1800s was getting together to preach theology, getting together to get revved up around theology, and people were either mentally assenting, mentally agreeing with what they were preaching, or they weren't. And only those who agreed were declared Christians. Now again, I'm speaking in generalities. God was certainly doing amazing other things at the time. But as a movement, this really affected the church in the late 1800s. Consequences again. Number one, a belief-based Christianity. Okay, uh, much of Christianity became belief-based, meaning that if you believe the right things, you were Christian. If you didn't believe the right things, you were not a Christian. And at first, as I said, that sounds pretty good. There are some things that we should, as Christians, embrace as truth. You know, you, you, but here's here's what here's what Paul said. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He said, it's all about Jesus. You know, if we can just get people to embrace Jesus, you know, may, you know that's good enough. Now, if you don't embrace the kingdom also, you're not going to have victory in your life. Maybe you're not going to have the, you know, the righteousness, peace, and joy that God promised you. But if you can at least get Jesus, you're in. You're, you, 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 you're part of the kingdom now. Right? You don't have to believe this way about foot washing or that way about how to take communion or that way about water baptism or that way about the end times or that way about... Like, it's all about Jesus. He who has the Son has life. If you don't have the Son, you do not have life. It's about Jesus, right? It's not about whether you play bingo, right? It's not about... <laughs> it's, 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 you know, if that person would just give up smoking, they'd be, be a great Christian. Well, if we can get everybody in the world to stop smoking, does that mean everybody will be a Christian? No. It'd be nice, though, right? It's like, but, but it's not about that. It's do they know Jesus Christ? And yet at the, at, the, at the end of the 1800s, it was not about that. It was about do you agree with these theologies? Belief-based Christianity. And it was also, therefore, exclusive-based Christianity. You're either in or you're out. And you're, you're in based upon our definition of what a good Christian is. Right? So suddenly, prohibition, you can't drink. Quebecers, you can't drink if you want to be a good Christian. I, I don't, that's why probably none of the New England revivalists ever came to Canada. Because they thought, Quebec, oh, it's hopeless. It's like, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it all became about this exclusive thing. If you want to be a born-again, Bible-believing, conservative, fundamental Christian, you have to obey all these rules, believe all these things, then you're in. And if you do any of these things, you know, like, even Billy Graham, like, is not Billy Graham probably the greatest evangelist of the, of the 20th century? He's been written off by the fundamentalists because he actually had supper with a Catholic priest one day. And they wrote him right off. and said, Billy Graham has fallen from grace because he had, you know... It doesn't matter that he still knows Jesus. <laughs> but he had supper with a Catholic. <laughs> like, it, go online someday. You'll discover all sorts of wonderful things being said about poor Billy just because he decided to love everybody. <laughs> um, 
Okay, exclusive-based Christianity. It, Christianity became very exclusive by the late 1800s versus what Paul said, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus, he is the Lord of your life, and you believe in your heart, you get at the core of your being that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. doesn't say anything about bingo or dancing or anything in that verse. It's about Jesus, right? It's about Jesus. So that was the, the, the problem with up to 1900, okay? There was this first, this fear-based Christianity that unfortunately is still with much of the church today. Then came this reason or ration, r- rational, rational Christianity, which is still, you know, I, one of the greatest theologians from one of the greatest Bible colleges and seminaries in the States just said about 10 years ago, he said, if it did not say in the word of God that Jesus loved me, I would have no way of knowing it because there is no other way to know his love than by reading this word. And I went, man, what, what if <laughs> Kathy and I get married and I'd sit there and look at the paper, you know, look at the marriage ticket. Oh, I feel so loved because here it says on the paper, I'm loved. This is so good. There are so many other ways to enjoy your marriage. Do we understand that? Than, than, than looking at a certificate on a piece of paper. Now, the certificate is important. But there are other ways to experience love from other people, including the love of God. Right? Okay. That's rational Christianity. And then came the third move, which was this, this uh, um, theological Christianity, right? This, this belief-based Christianity. And still there are people today that will argue and argue and argue with the theology. And, and just the, the attitudes they express are so ungodly, but they think they're on the good side or they think they got it made because at least they got their theology down. That's our legacy today, folks. That's what we're struggling with a lot of the church. Then we come to the 20th century, and the 20th century has been a glorious century. There have been wonderful things this century, and I wish I had time to, expl- to just give you, describe all the incredible things God has done this century. But again, we want to look at some of the consequences of what's been happening this century. So we start in the 20th century, the, the Welsh Revival. Who hasn't heard about the Welsh Revival in 1904, 1905? Uh, um, with, with, with Evan Roberts, uh, so much, the revival came to Wales. Over hundred thousand people were converted in Wales in one year. Prisons were shut down, bars were shut down, gambling joints were shut down because the people were radically saved and changed for Lord Jesus Christ. It started when. All Evan Roberts, he's a very unlearned man. I think he was 25 years old when he started, and he started having visions, and he just got in front of people, started declaring the visions that he saw from God. And people went, wow, that's amazing. And people's hearts were pricked, and they were converted by hearing what God was speaking through Evan Roberts. It started with visions. It went into miracles, started happening. It was a glorious time. And for that year, from mid-2000 mid and, I'm sorry, mid-1904 to mid-1905, it was, it was an amazing revival that people came and, and took part of the revival back to their own countries. But it only lasted one year because people came to hear Evan. Right? He was the guy with the visions. They came to hear Evan. And in one year, he burned out. He ended up a penniless man. He was a beggar on the streets. He was totally wasted after one year because everyone came looking for Evan. And as soon as he was burnt out, people just turned their backs and did their own thing again. Even though it impacted Wales to such a great, great degree, because they looked to one man, things stopped. Then in, in 1906 to 1913, yeah, blah, 1906 to 1913, we called the Azusa Street Revival. Remember that? Or maybe you've never heard of that. Los Angeles, California. A black preacher named William Seymour, who had been filled with the Spirit in 1901, he goes to uh, Azusa Street, and he starts preaching about baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in you. He's speaking new languages. And he started just ministering to people, talking about the Holy Spirit. People were filled in the Holy Spirit every day. Sometimes thousands of people would come to this building that only held about 150. They had services around the clock, 24 hours a day. And, and really from 1906 
1906 to 1913, what's that? Four or five, seven years, people, seven years, every day, people coming to Azusa Street. People were healed. Um, and people took what they'd experienced in those meetings back to every part of the world. And really, the Azusa Street Revival of 1906 was the, really, what do you call it? The, the, it led to the birth of the modern Pentecostal movement around the world. And now today, I think there's over 600 million Pentecostals around the world. All came out of that move of God in 1906. Okay? But there was a problem. When the, when the Azusa Street Revival came and people, pastors, got filled with the Spirit, they went back to their churches and they preached about baptism of the Holy Spirit and people started speaking in tongues and experiencing the fullness of the Spirit of God. When people heard, they thought they were crazy and they would throw rocks at them during the service. They would actually throw rocks through the windows and hit people in the head with rocks. They would burn down their church buildings. They would take the pastors and beat them up. Okay? Because they were suddenly doing something that even though it's in the Bible, it was not rational. It was not, you know, it's like, this is outside of my theology, right? It, it was, it, it, you know, and, and so they were persecuted by the rest of the church. And what happened was, those men and women of God were courageous, though, and they, they kept their faith, they kept the belief that, yes, baptism of the Holy Spirit is for today, but what it did, unfortunately, in their thinking, it created a persecution mindset, where everybody's against us. So what we need to do is hold on so tightly to this truth of baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what's wrong with that? Well, 20 years later, God's doing a new thing. But we're going to hold on tightly to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 30 years later, God's doing another new thing. They said, no, we've got to hold on tightly to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I talked to a board member of, of a, a, a church that comes out of that classical Pentecostal movement. And he says, you know the problem with our church? We're stuck in the 1950s. We've never got beyond it. See, there was this persecution mentality that said, we've got to hold on so tightly to what we have, but as a result, the early Pentecostal movement, it's been hard for them to embrace anything new that God is doing today. Okay? And so, when the next move came along, the healing move of, of the 1940s and 50s, the healing movement, they had to reject it because they're still hanging on to that thing that God gave them in 1906. But God was doing a new thing. He was teaching the church about healing. He was teaching the church that healing was for today. And so God raised up a, an amazing number of men, some of which uh, Oral Roberts came out of that movement, Jack Coe, William Branham, A.A. A. Allen, Gordon Lindsay, T.L. Osborne. And, and there was a new emphasis on healing around the world in the church, except for those that had to hold on to the old baptism and in the Holy Spirit, and, and they were persecuting these guys. But God was doing a new thing. Catherine Kuhlman. Bill Prankard came out of that time, too. What a godly man he is. Wonderful man of God. But there was some weaknesses to that movement, too. What were the weaknesses, the consequences? Um, the, that movement became very man-centered, right? I gave you the names. Some of you, when you heard the names, you go, oh, yeah, I've heard that name. I've heard that name. But the problem was, it was not church-centered or like people of God-centered. It was, it was centered on a few men, okay? So everyone went, went to hear the man, to see the woman. And unfortunately, a number of those men and women fell into sin. And a number of those men and women started teaching pretty bizarre stuff because they thought, well, if God's given me this revelation of healing, maybe God's given me another revelation on another matter. But see, Paul himself said, I, I know what my sphere of ministry is, and I stay within it. Right? He says, Peter's to the Jews, I'm to the Gentiles. Even though I'm a Jew, God's called me to the Gentiles. And here's the message I have. This is the, the, the message, the information, the, the movement, the, the, the anointing that God's given me, and I stay within it. But a lot of these guys, they said, oh, well, if God's given me this revelation, let's see if he can give me a revelation on this thing. And some of the worst doctrines that the church has struggled with came out of that movement because the guys thought that God wanted to do more with them. If they had just stayed with what God was doing in their lives, it would have been great. You know, it's, it's like, I know one guy, when it comes to healing, when it comes to the, just the wholeness, he's phenomenal, but now he's trying to get revelation on the end times, and he's preaching the weirdest things. And, and uh, it's just too bad, because if he just stayed with what God gave him, he'd be doing great, okay? Uh, anyway, so that was kind of the, uh, the weakness of that movement, is that it was very man-centered, and when men fell, it confused people, and... And again, we still struggle with those things today, right? 
Then came the latter rain outpouring. I'm, I'm almost done. The latter rain outpouring of 1948 to 1952, good Canadian city, North Battleford, Saskatchewan, where the Holy Spirit just fell in a brand new way. There was uh, healings, visions, prophetic words, words of knowledge, dancing in the Spirit, singing in the Spirit, Spirit-led worship, Spirit-led prayer. And they, folk, and they started teaching that God wanted relational networks. He didn't really, got, well, they actually taught God hated denominations, and that wasn't so cool either. But they said God is wanting relational networks, which, yes, God wants relationships. And, and they, they, they embraced a recognition of the fivefold ministry, that there had to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers working together for, for, the, for the church to be healthy, Okay. And there was a strong, strong emphasis on spirit-led worship. They would worship for hours as led by the Holy Spirit. They developed what's called a victorious eschatology, which means at the end times, God is going to renew his church, revive his church. The church is going to have great influence on the world at the end of time, rather than at the time when everybody thought, oh, we just beam me up, Jesus, because it's going to get worse and worse and worse, right? They had this theology that God was actually going to do something amazing at the end of time. And they, and they believed that God was going to have a strong Christian influence in the world at the end of the time. And this movement, the, la the latter rain movement of 48 to 52, became the foundation for almost all charismatic churches around the world, almost all prophetic churches around the world, almost all apostolic churches around the world. Okay? And it, so it, even though it was, it, it, it was not as well known as the Pentecostal movement, it's really become a major influence on, on the, the Pentecostal stream um, around the world today, okay? But again, there was some weaknesses. One of the weaknesses was they put more emphasis on visions than on God's Word. They actually, their meetings, they started to call their meetings television meetings because everyone would come in and tell their vision. You tell your vision, I'll tell my vision. So they had television meetings, right? And, 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 and uh, and a lot of times their visions contain really bad theology because they didn't know how to interpret their visions correctly, right? And so one of the weaknesses of that whole movement was more emphasis on visions than on the Word of God. And unfortunately, some, of, uh, some extreme theology came out of that movement too, like the uh, Extreme Manifest Sons of God movement, which says that at the end of time, God will make... There'll come a point in church's history where all Christians will become perfect. We won't be able to sin. We won't be able to think any bad thoughts at all. It's going to be wonderful. Wouldn't that be, it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But that's what their teaching was, that one day all the sons and daughters of God are just going to be perfect, okay? And they also came up with this thing that God is so loving at the end of time, the Spirit of God is going to go on the face of the earth, and everybody's going to get saved. Everybody's going to get saved. Probably even the devil's going to get saved. Everybody's going to get saved. And it's, they call it universalism, okay? So there was some extreme doctrines that came out of that. But it was a glorious movement, okay? Whenever God does something, we kind of mess it up, right? But, okay. So one last movement, and then I just got some conclusions. I want to talk about the vineyard movement. And, and some people say, well, that, you know, that's just a single denomination. I, I really want to give honor to that movement today. Because, see, what happened was, a guy named Ken Gillickson, he started, yeah, you probably know how to say it better than me. Yeah, okay. And he started a Bible study, and he actually had uh, some Christian recording artists in his Bible study, and they started other Bible studies. He ended up with 13 Bible studies that were seeking God for a fresh passion, a fresh encounter with the Lord. And about that time, God raised up a man named John Wimber. And John Wimber started a church in Southern California in 1977. And this guy, uh, Ken uh, Gillickson, whatever, okay. He met John and he said, you know what, I believe what I'm hearing from you and I want to give you my 13 Bible studies. And they came together and they formed the church that eventually became known as the Anaheim Vineyard Church of Cali Southern California. And the reason I honor John Wimber is because what John Wimber did, he looked at all those movements we talked about of the 20th century, and he said, wow, yeah, that was God. And oh, that, you know, that's singing in the Spirit, that was God. Oh, healing, yeah, that was God. And, and, and prof yeah, that's prophecy, that's God. And, and uh, signs and wonders, that's God. And, you know, focusing on the Word of God, that's God. And, and, and he took all those things that God had done over the last 70 years, and he says, let's embrace it, let's prayerfully work with it and try to bring a healthy expression to all these things that God had done over the last 70 years. 
And so he became almost like the modern father or the modern uh, instigator of a new emphasis on church growth, modern praise and worship, you know, the Vineyard Music label, uh, the small groups, right, is uh, kin, kin, what are they called? Kinship groups, yeah, uh, which are small groups, amazing small groups. The prophetic movement, he really brought it to the forefront. Signs and wonders, right, power evangelism, power healing, um, church planning movement. Um, in, in 15 years, they planted over 1,500 churches, Amazing. Um, the deliverance and inner healing movement, right? Uh, equipping the saints, getting back to equipping the church. But you know what he did? He brought one new thing into the church that time. He, one more, if you want to call it movement. Uh, he introduced this one new thing that I call the Father's Love Movement. And he says, you know what? And, and if you know the name Ed Peoric was one of the main component, uh, proponents of that. And he says, we're going to redeem all those things that got messed up during the last 70 years, but we're going to do everything through the Father's love. So we're going to preach the, all the truth, but through the Father's love. And we're going to prophesy, but through the Father's love. We're going to pray for sickness, but as, a, as, a, as an expression of the Father's love. We're going to worship and use music, but as an expression of the Father's love. And, and I, like, I, I just... I really honor John Wimber. I think, as a lot of you know, he died in the mid-1990s of cancer. But he had, he had brought such a healthy expression back to the church because he understood that faith works by love. As Gee, the Bible says that, right? And, and you know, he didn't, it's like, he didn't say, if you want to be a good Christian, you have to speak in tongues. He said, you... He said, guess what, guys? You're Christian now. You get to speak in tongues. Right? It, it was not about you have to legalistically, but because tongues is an expression of the Father's love to build you up in your most holy faith, you get to do it. And there came a point when those that were preaching, you must speak in tongues to be a good Christian, their denominate, their, that movement, only 30% of the people in that movement could speak in tongues. But in John Wimber's movement that said, you just get to because of the expression of the Father's love, 80% of the people in that movement could speak in tongues. Right? Because legalism will always stifle what God is trying to do. Okay? And he didn't say, you know, if you're a good Christian, you've you got to learn how to heal the sick. He says, guess what, folks? You get to heal the sick because healing is an expression of the Father's love to other people. And so for the, really the first time in, in, in the modern history of the church, a church movement was formed that was learning how to express the kingdom through the love of the Father. And it, and it transformed the world. It really did transform the modern world. If we stay in the Father's love. <laughs> but there were some down things to even John Wimber. A couple, just a couple ones. One was... That whole movement of 1,500 churches looked at John Wimber. Now, he did rightly put key leaders in every country, right? There's Vineyard Canada with a leader, Vineyard Germany with a leader, Vineyard South Africa with a leader. But when it came to the Vineyard movement globally, they kept looking to John. Everything had to go through John. And, and, and so rather than developing an apostolic team, everyone had to keep going to John, Pastor John, Father Heart John. Right? Everybody looked up to him as a spiritual father. Uh, and, but because it was all on him, there's a lot of weight on John in those days. The second thing, and here some of you might not like this, but the second thing in my studies, that he embraced the prophetic movement, and he allowed the prophetic movement to inform him and give him insight, but there came a point where God was trying to raise John up as an apostle, and he actually kept deferring to the prophets, and there came a, a point when the prophets started to run the show. And I'm not trying to say prophets are bad, but what I'm saying is that in the Old Testament, the prophets submitted to the apostles. In the New Testament, the prophets submitted to the apostles. Because the prophets saw what God wanted, but it was the apostles that had to strategize and lay the foundations and make it happen. And because he submitted or was influenced too much by the prophets, by the early, early 19, uh, 1990s, um, there were a lot of spiritual prophecies coming forth. A lot of people were being hurt. In 1991, John said, you know what? We've gone too far, and we have to pull things back in a bit. And, and there started to be a little bit of a power struggle in 1991, and it was just a couple years after that. 
the Toronto Airport Church whole thing happened, but we'll talk about that next week. But what I'm basically saying is that John was being raised up by God as an apostle over an amazing movement, but he didn't step into it. He allowed the prophetic voices to keep running, guiding, making the decisions. And there came a place where even John Wimber said, I believe that we started to stray from, from, the, from the purpose and the direction that God's given us in this ministry. And in 1991, he tried to pull things back in. And uh, we'll leave it at that, okay? So like I said, uh, John Wimber, I never met him, but I've read many of his teachings. He was a, a really an incredible man of God. But the point of sharing all this is not to, again, the point of sharing you church history was not to share with you church history, but to say, if we're going to go forward, if we're going to develop a strategy and a direction for the next um, 20 years or more, there's some musts we have to embrace, okay? And I'm going to go through these really quickly, the musts. You know, you know, because again, I said, there are still people preaching a fear-based gospel 250, 300 years later. There are still people preaching a reason-based gospel. There are still people preaching a theology-based gospel. And there are still people making all the same mistakes that the church made in the 20th century. And if the church is going to go forward, we don't have to condemn them or put them out. We've got to be honest enough to see what they really did and learn from their mistakes. And so here's nine musts that we're going to go through really quickly. Number one, we must never use fear to lead people to Christ. Never use fear to lead people to Christ because fear keeps believers distant from God. Fear forces believers to live by rules and not by relationship. What did Jesus himself say? Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to draw you to me, to my breast as a mother hen gathers her chicks. But he said, you would not, you would not. Just refuse to try to scare somebody into the kingdom of heaven. It works, but you pretty well damage their ability to have a healthy relationship with Jesus after that. So let's, we must never use fear to lead people to Christ. Number two, we must demonstrate both reason and power of the gospel. We have to demonstrate both together, okay? Cause, because reason alone causes people to have a solely rational faith. But power alone causes people to seek after the signs and wonders and never get, no, never get solid in, in the rationality of their faith. We've got to have this balance between, yes, the gospel is truth, and if we understand it with the Spirit of God, it makes sense. But we've also got to demonstrate the power of God because that's what confirms the truth we're preaching. Okay? Number three, we must keep Jesus as the center of our faith. Okay? Avoiding bingo should not be the center of our faith. Okay? Uh, avoiding bars should not be the center of our faith. Avoiding anything should not be the center of faith. The center of faith has to be Jesus. Okay? Theological agreement does not guarantee salvation. Okay? We don't accept Jesus with our heads. We invite him into our hearts. Unity is a work of the Spirit. It's not based upon agreement, intellectual agreement. If you try to have agreement based upon intellectualism, you end up with everybody agreeing on the lowest common point, and so you end up with no agreement at all because you don't have any truth anymore. Jesus is still the only way to the Father, right? I am the way, Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the life, I am the way to the Father. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the center of our faith, and we've got to remember that we must keep Jesus as the center of faith. Number four, we need to learn. We must learn how to work in teams. The harvest will never be retained by individuals. As individuals, we can lead somebody to Christ, but the harvest will never be retained by individuals. We have to work together. Movements led by individuals eventually die. Movements led by teams will survive. Okay. Number five, we must be willing to embrace whatever God is doing. Okay? We have to embrace what God has done in the past, but we also have to embrace what God is doing and what he's about to do. Because if you think the church is going to look like this in 20 years, you are sadly mistaken. 
The church is going to transition, tra be transformed in the next 20 years, and it will look different. And if you're not willing to embrace the change, you will lose out on what God wants to do in your life, in your family's life, and in your church's life. Number six, we must be led by people, but we need to glorify only God. We must not put any person on a pedestal and glorify them or set them up as if they're a God. Because God is obligated, right? God is obligated to pull down any idol that you make in your life, including another person. If you set anybody up too high, you're, you are basically setting them up for a fall. We must be led by people that glorify only God. Number seven, these are all lessons I got out of this thing today, okay? We must let the Bible be our final guide and truth. We must let the Bible, you know, and I'm speaking to everybody in this room, no matter what your age, let the Bible be our final guide and truth. No revelation or vision should ever be put above God's word, okay? I've heard... And you say, well, that makes sense. Hey, you know how many people I've heard in the last two years say, I don't care what the Bible says, God showed me. Did you just hear what you just said? <laughs> I don't care what the Bible says, but God showed you. And then they go and they show you stuff that is so counter the Bible. And then out comes that infamous, well, you know, God wants me to be happy. Does he really? You ever thought about that? Does God really want you to be happy? And how many people say that God wants me to be happy and they end up settling for the world's happiness rather than the kingdom's righteousness, peace, and joy? Instead, they settle for temporal happiness. You want to be happy? Here's how to be happy. I'm just, this just came to me. I'm sorry, give me this real quick. New Testament, Matthew. Okay, ha you want to be happy? Here's how you can be happy. Happy are those who are poor and realize their need for Jesus. Happy are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Happy are those who humble themselves, for they'll inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Happy are those who are merciful, because they'll be shown mercy. Happy are those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Happy are those who work for peace, because they will be called the children of God. And happy are those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Want to be happy? <laughs> Get ready. <laughs> let the Bible, we must let the Bible be our final guide in truth. Number eight, we must become students of this word. We have to be, because you're going to have people with fine signing arguments come to you that will try to deceive you. Even right now in our schools, people are putting gobbledygook into the minds of our kids that is so erroneous, but it sounds good. Even science has proved so much of what our kids are being taught right now has proved them wrong, and yet they're still teaching it because it sounds good. A clear understanding of God's word is indispensable for every believer. Don't just shine it, you know, put it in a prominent place. Just pick it up and read it. Or, you know, as, as, as we do today, right? Yeah, I'm going to read my Bible now. <laughs> now. Wherever you keep it, try reading it. I had one kid come and said, look at Pastor Dave. Look at Pastor Dave. I got the Bible on my phone now. Oh, that's cool. How often do you read it? Oh, I haven't yet. <laughs> oh, okay. But it's a cool app, right? Number nine. We must allow for proper functioning of the fivefold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. We must allow them to function properly in unity, working together, because only then will we be able to retain, bring in, retain the harvest that God is presently preparing for us. We've got to get our act together, basically. Um, we've got to learn these lessons. We've got to reject the negative. We've got to work on the good things. And next week, I'm going to give us even more clarification and, and fine-tuning so that we can have a sense of where God wants us to go 
in the next decade, two decades, and beyond. Let's stand to our feet. Thank you so much for your uh, uh, patience. I know I, I've gone over. Um, you know, go through your notes again. Just if I said something that offended your, uh, something about your, fam- your, your favorite evangelist, that's okay. Um, you know, it's like we're all human. Can we, we, do we understand that we're all human? Do we understand we all make mistakes? Do you understand we got to give grace to everybody? Thanks for grace to me. <laughs> Appreciate you. Father, in Jesus' name, help us. You know, God, I, I don't know whether to thank you or repent. Uh, God, Lord, we do repent of becoming reason-based. We repent of becoming legalistic. We repent of... of uh, doing anything that's not by love. God, yeah, that's what we need to do. Lord, we repent of anything we've tried to do for your kingdom that was not motivated by love and was not expressed through love. Lord, forgive us for trying to share the treasures of the glory of the kingdom through our flesh. Forgive us for not expressing your Father's heart to our children, to our neighbors, to our workmates, to people in the church. Forgive us by being motivated by anything other than your love. And today, Father, as we just raise a hand to you, or even those two hands, put one hand in the Father's love and one in the glory of God, and just say, Lord, my heart's wide open now. Would you just fill me with your love and fill me with a an awe of your glory and power, that I will not make those mistakes of the past, but I will walk my heart being true to you, my heart being true to your glorious gospel, my heart being true to your love. Help me, God, to be a carrier of the kingdom of God to a dying and hurting world that needs your power and needs your love. Lord, would you help us to become true demonstrations of what it means to be a child of God, founded on truth and full of your love and released through the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to demonstrate the kingdom of God even today as we go into our our community. Lord, help us to learn the lessons so that we will not repeat them, but instead will only carry the glorious kingdom wherever we go. Yeah. What can I say, Father? Help us be carriers of your love. Help us. Help me. Help Kathy. Help my kids. Help this church. Help Christians around the world to do everything through love the Father's love, in Jesus' name. Amen.